My learnings about Tamoko led me down an unfamiliar research pathway, which was initially a bit daunting, but as I progressed I found an unexpected but welcome comfort in challenging my Pākehā approach and ways of thinking. And I can't stress how much I've learned from exploring oceanic literature through a kaupapa Māori lens. On reflection, and maybe out of a need to make connections, I felt that my method was a bit like an analogy of an approach to putting together a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle, though instead of previously where I would have started with poring over the picture on the box lid and starting with the straight-edge border pieces, this time I started without a picture for guidance and pieced together smaller pictures within the bigger picture. While I'm not suggesting my learning is or could ever be complete, and with particular reference to Mika's assertions about dominant Western thought, which encourages us to stand upon a final foundation rather than be immersed in it. For the purposes of my analogy, the outcome of approaching my puzzle this way still created a complete puzzle, 1,000 interlocking pieces, that no matter how you put them together, they create the same picture. So while I began my research in much the same way I would usually begin researching a new topic about something I had very little knowledge of or about, I soon realised that in order to complete my assignment, my puzzle, I would need to let go of my own preconceived, preconceived methods and see where my discoveries led. <clears throat> I really felt that this was a change of approach that enabled me to gain a much deeper awareness of not only tamoko but of oceanic literatures and the wide-ranging and ongoing effects and implications of colonisation. For this assignment, I have started with a basic assertion that if our individual and collective narratives emerge from communication, it's logical that whatever the medium our communications embrace becomes a form of literature. Shifting focus from a non-oceanic or dominant cultural definition of literature to the purposes or functions of literature and its inherent connection with culture was a defining realisation in my approach to my learnings about tamoko and forms the basis for my argument that tamoko is undeniably a customary oceanic literature. So I will discuss the inextricable link between culture and knowledge and identity and the effects of colonisation on the customary practice of tamoko. Due to the uniqueness of tamoko, whether customary or contemporary, I'd like to mention now that I decided to korero instead of try and interpret a specific example of an individual's moko, I felt that it would be too intrusive of me as Pākehā to attempt to attribute meaning to an individual's moko in a way that could only extend a superficial definition or interpretation. Culture is the narrative that explains where we came from, who we are, what we believe and how we live. In Te Ao Māori it is expressed and transmitted in proverbs, storytelling, mythology, legend, poetry, music, dance and art. Wendt asserts that culture is not static and it evolves from knowledge sharing and communication. A visual representation and connection to a wearer's whakapapa, the customary practice of tamoko was an integral part of Māori identity. The lines, patterns and motifs of customary tamoko were unique to an individual and indicated Fano hapu and iwi affiliations, as well as the wearer's place within social structures. Tamoko was as unique as a fingerprint. Customary tamoko was a long, long and painful process that was rich in ritual and communication. It was developed and practiced by tohonga tamoko, whose role was that of esteemed protectors and sources of knowledge. Contemporary tamoko continues to be a deeply spiritual experience for Māori and between Māori, and as a cultural marker, it, <clears throat> it conveys and represents a shared understanding of the significance of a journey. Tāmoko has its own kōpapa. As a customary practice, tāmoko was an embodiment of kōpapa Māori, a concept inherent to Māori identity. In the Māori story of creation, the world was seen as an all-encompassing and interconnected whānau. In customary Māori belief, te kore, te kore was reflected in whakapapa and was central to the concepts of mana and tapu. Tāmoku 
communicated and preserved whakapapa through processes instilled with concepts of mana. For example, the practice of tamoko was restricted as a discipline of esteemed tohonga tamoko, and tamoko itself was an indicator of mana. The concept of tapu, for example, was evident in the way the most sacred moko styles were reserved for the face, and the virtue of a wearer's moko could also render them tapu. Tapu also came from bleeding and the way in which the person receiving the moko could, couldn't speak, feed themselves or be touched by anyone else. There were strict rules around food and healing rituals that included blessings and chants. Tamoko symbolically connected an individual to their ancestors and lineage. It was a vehicle for symbolic messages to express identity. And as identity is central to Kopapa Māori, how could ta Tamoko not be considered a literary form? In her 2003 research paper, Gallagher describes Tamoko as, as a complex, intricate and effective form of identification and a living document re represented by meaningful marks on the human body. Gallagher goes on to describe the text of Ta Moko as being used by many notable chiefs who would draw their moko in precise detail as their signature. Ta Moko represented ancestral information from both sides of the family and specific areas of the face conveyed specific information. Only a tohonga Ta Moko was able to apply Ta Moko Individual designs were recognisable and able to be read by others' in interpretation, which indicates that tamoko as a means of communication was unquestionably a, a visual form of literature. Customary tamoko was considered taonga as it linked Māori with their ancestors, their, whakapa, their whakapapa. Reclaiming Māori perspectives, knowledge and wisdom that has been devalued, suppressed and even outlawed because they were not or are not considered important or worthwhile to the dominant philosophies, content and pedagogy of colonisers is of utmost importance. This was and continues to be apparent in, but not limited to, literature, in Aotearoa's education system, which is domi dominated by non-Oceanic post-colonial content and pedagogy and does very little to value kōpapa Māori. As an ongoing consequence, Māori are des denied the very essence of what it means to be Māori. This is the reason why tamoko, as an expression of kōpapa Māori and therefore Māori culture, must be valued, respected and preserved as an Oceanic literature. Tamoko is a critical meaningful and beautiful expression of kōpapa Māori and the loss of this taonga as an, as an integral expression of identity, this literature, would be devastating to Māori as tangata whenua of Aotearoa. A world view in the culture it produces is based on a set of ideas reinforced over time and as stated, culture is not static nor, nor, nor fixed. Instead, it evolves and continues to adapt. The most major changes occurred after the arrival of Europeans when they brought agricultural, scientific and industrial changes as well as religion and a world view which rapidly became the dominant view. Tamoko did not fit the conventional boundaries of Aotearoa's post-European contact print culture and therefore was not recognised or valued as literature, despite the colonists' understanding that the message of tamoko was fundamental to the identity of the wearer. By 1840, customary tamoko was in decline due to the influences, views and values of the missionaries. The Tohonga Suppression Act of 1907 outlawed the spiritual and educational role of tohonga, which resulted in the deliberate suppression of knowledge and skills of customary Māori practices. The impacts of colonisation were devastating for Māori learning customs, which were central to the protection and preservation of knowledge. In his discussion paper, Clark examines the pre-European contact tribal structure of Māori society, stating, each iwi being a nation unto itself with its own distinctive leadership system, particular economy and customary practices. Suppressing the integral, integral role of tohonga as the protectors and communicators of knowledge, 
through their highly skilled and specialised practices, which is tohonga embodied concepts such as mana and tapu, including tohonga tamoko, was a suppression and devaluation of Māori culture. The 1980s saw a revival of tamoko as part of a push to revive te reo Māori, tikanga and cultural pride. Makare discusses the special role of kuia as kaitiaki of taonga, for example, in preserving tikanga of customary practices such as raranga and te reo. In te ao Māori, whare tangata is central to the preservation of whakapapa, and it was kuia as bearers of past, present and future generations, and who were the last generations generation to receive moko kowai in the 1920s, who inspired the revival of moko kowai. It's this preservation of tikanga that is central to the survival of tamoko as a treasured Māori literature.